Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. Please be seated. Thanks for the warm welcome. Thanks for coming. I'm looking forward to having what I think you'll find to be a very interesting dialogue about innovative ways to make sure that our health care system addresses the needs of our individual citizens. Uh, you know, this is an issue that requires uh, a lot of dialogue so people understand the problems and a lot of, kind of innovative thinking to make sure that the system works. Uh, my judgment is the system won't work if medical decisions are made by government. I believe the best kind of decision making occurs when consumers make decisions and the relationship between their doctors and the patients are, uh, are become the cornerstone of good health care policy. And so we'll, we're going to have a dialogue. I want to thank our fellow citizens for being here. Uh, we just had a little discussion about how to make sure this conversation goes without flaw. <laughs> I'm confident it will. Uh, first, I want to thank the governor of the great state of Maryland for joining us today. You know that at times I take a little a brief weekend retreat in the great state of Maryland at a fine facility called Camp David. And the last time the governor was there I was with Laura and me. He and the first lady were there, and it happened to be the day of the blizzard. So I've invited him back in the summer. <laughs> I want to thank my friend Elias Zerhouni, the director of the National Institute of Health. I appreciate the job you're doing, Doc. You're doing a fabulous job. I want to thank Les Crawford, who's with us today, the acting director of the acting commissioner of the FDA. Thank you, Les, for being here. I want to thank everybody else who has come. I'm honored that you're interested in this very important subject. Before we talk about health care, though, I do want to talk about a couple of other subjects. One, uh, I am, I, as you could tell from a speech I gave last week, a firm believer in freedom and the ability of freedom to bring peace to our world. I am uh, uh, so pleased to watch liberty advance uh, throughout the world in places that where people, in places where people never dreamt liberty would come. I want our fellow citizens to see what is happening uh, in our world in the last couple of months. I mean, in Afghanistan, millions of people voted for uh, a president. For the first time in 5,000 years, it's a, it's a grand moment in history when people who had been condemned to tyranny uh, by, in this case, the Taliban, have a chance to express themselves in the ballot box, at the ballot box, to let their opinions be known as to how government ought to respond to their needs. Uh, as well, the Palestinians elected new leadership. I am very pleased by the courage and leadership shown by Abu Mazen, his desire to unify security forces within the Palestinian territory so as to defeat the terrorists there and allow for democracy to advance. I believe, I believe a Palestinian democracy will emerge and will grow enabling us to achieve a goal of two states, Israel and Palestine, living side by side in peace. As well, the Ukraine swore in a new president, which was a remarkable advance of democracy in that part of the world. And finally, this Sunday, after years of brutal tyranny, the long-suffering people of Iraq will go to the polls to vote for a... Freedom is on the march. Freedom will continue on the march. And therefore, the world will be more peaceful, and we'll be able to say we left behind a more steady and stable and peaceful world for our children and our grandchildren. At home, uh, we've got to make sure freedom continues on the march as well. Uh, that starts with making sure every child receives a great education. The No Child Left Behind Act is the beginning of making sure high standards and accountability come to our classroom so that not one single child is left behind. We're making progress, and over the next four years, we'll continue to make progress. The, kind, the world is watching as to whether or not we're able to manage our budgets. You know, one of the things people say, are you capable of dealing with twin deficits? 
On the one hand, we have a fiscal deficit. So I'll be submitting a budget to the United States Congress that sets clear priorities. One of the priorities of my administration was doubling the funding for NIH so we continue to stay on the leading edge of, of research and technological change. We understand how important science is. We understand it's important to be the, you know, the leading nation when it comes to research. And we'll continue to stay there. But we are funding some things that aren't effective as well. And so the budget I submit to the United States Congress will uh, work on reducing our deficit in half by over a five-year period of the time, and at the same time funding uh, much-needed priorities. As terms of the uh, current account deficit, that would be the deficit as, as far as our trade goes, the best way to deal with the current account deficit is to make sure America is the best place in the world to do business, to risk capital, so that we can continue to grow our economy. And the first step of doing that is uh, for Congress to bring meaningful legal reform to my desk early in this legislative session, reforming the asbestos law, reforming class action lawsuits, and reforming medical liabilities. <laughs> we'll continue to work on free and fair trade. I believe I, you know, we can compete with anybody anywhere so long as the rules are fair. We need to open up markets around the world so our farmers and entrepreneurs and manufacturers can sell our products around the world. And we need to make sure the regulations are fair. Uh, we got to make sure that um, we got to make sure that taxes remain low so as not to snuff out the entrepreneurial spirit in America. I mean our economy is growing, small businesses are vibrant, alive and well. New jobs are cre being created by small businesses and we want to continue that momentum. I mean, people are finding work. We've recovered from a session, and it's important for Congress to understand that we've got to create an environment for continued capital expansion if we want our people to find jobs. And so I'm looking forward to working with them. We've got a lot of big challenges ahead of us, and one of the biggest challenges of all is Social Security. And it's a challenge because if you're a you know, dad, for example, of a 23, 24-year-old child, when that child comes time to retire, the system's broke. <laughs> it's flat bust. Uh, in 13 years, the system begins to go negative. That's more money going out than coming in. And so it seems like to me, for you know, people like me who have gotten respons in res uh, positions of responsibility, we should deal with this issue and not pass it on in hopes that it gets better. It's not going to get better unless Congress works with the administration to have a permanent long-term fix for Social Security. If we do not act, the cost becomes more expensive in the out years. If we do not act, there's going to be a need for huge payroll tax increases and or major benefit cuts. So now's the time to move. And I understand there's a reluctance by some in Congress to take on a tough decision. But I believe we've been elected for a reason, and that is to confront problems and to work together in a bipartisan spirit. For those seniors who are worried about the debate on Social Security, you have nothing to worry about. Nothing will change. But your children and your grandchildren do have something to worry about. And so I look forward to working with the Congress to come up with a long-term solution to fix Social Security. As well, we need to come up with reasonable, common-sense policies to address the rising cost of health care. And so today we're going to talk about some innovative ideas. Uh, one is health savings accounts. And we'll be talking to an employer and somebody, a beneficiary like me, of a health savings account. A health savings account enables a person to be in charge of his or her own health care decisions. Health care savings account will cover major catastrophic problems and at the same time allow a person to save and or a business to save tax-free for the everyday expenses of health care. And if, in fact, you have not reached your uh, limit for your, for, for your uh, catastrophic care, in other words, if you have money left over, you can roll it over tax-free into a savings account that you call your own. And we'll, we've got some people who can probably explain this better than me here, consumers of health savings accounts. But health savings accounts uh, all aim at empowering people to make decisions for themselves, owning their own health care plan, and at the same time bringing some demand control into the cost of health care. Our view is, is that if you're a consumer of health care and you're in the marketplace making health care decisions, it is more likely that there be more cost control in health care than a system in which the consumer of health care has 
his or her health care bills paid by a third-party provider. Secondly, we're going to talk about uh, association health plans, which will allow small businesses to pool across jurisdictional boundaries to be able to afford health care insurance at the same discounts that big companies get. The principle behind health, uh, association health plans is that the more risk you're able to spread amongst uh, beneficiaries, the lower your cost of health care. And unfortunately, too many laws restrict small businesses from being able to uh, pool risk. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about an innovative way to establish a national marketplace for health care uh, by allowing people to get on the Internet and buy a health care plan in a state other than that in which you live. It's kind of an interesting way to encourage more consumer activism, more choices uh, for our uh, citizens here in the country. And finally, we're going to talk about uh, making sure that we expand our uh, a children's health savings program. And we're going to talk to a, a lady who's been very much involved in encouraging people to sign up for what's called S-CHIP so the youngest citizens can take care of the government programs that are now available. As well, I want to remind you all that, um, that we, we, we will continue to promote an uh, adequate safety net for our citizens. And by that, uh, we've got community health, uh, health centers in America today. I want to continue to expand community health centers. This is the place where the poor and the indigent can get primary care. And they're great centers. And Congress has been very cooperative in the past of funding our budget requests. And I hope they do again as we continue to expand these uh, community health centers all across the United States of America. Uh, we will uh, obviously continue to make sure Medicare fulfills its promise. Uh, obviously, I felt the system needed to be reformed. It was a system that would pay, for example, for hospitalization of a senior citizen for heart surgery, but not for the medicine that could prevent the heart surgery from being needed in the first place. It was a system that needed to be changed. And at the same time, it was a system that needed to respond to the demands of our senior citizens. And so we introduced market, uh, market uh, forces into the Medicare system to make it such that it can continue to evolve and grow and change as medicine changes and therefore meet the needs of our senior citizens. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to go to Cleveland to talk about the uh, importance and need of uh, information technology in the healthcare field. If you really think about many industries in America, they've been able to modernize and become more productive by introducing IT and information technology into their industries. It's a little difficult, a little more difficult task here in healthcare. I mean, we got 21st, uh, century, 21st century medical practices, but you know, that 19th century um, paperwork system. You know, doctors are still, you know, writing prescriptions by hand. Most doctors can't write clearly anyway, and so it's a so there's a better way to uh, enable our, 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 our health care system to wring out inefficiencies and to protect our patients. So medical electronic records is going to be one of the great innovations in medicine, and I look forward to talking about ways to advance information technology in health care. Uh, finally, uh, a way to make sure that um, uh, our citizens are able to better afford health care is to speed generic drugs to the market. I want to thank the FDA for for propagating rules that uh, prevent pharmaceuticals from uh, delaying the uh, advent and access for, to our consumers of generic drugs. These drugs do the exact same thing as brand name drugs do, and, uh, and yet cost a fraction of the cost of the brand names. And so we're doing a better job of spin speeding generics to the markets, and that's a positive development for our seniors and all citizens for that matter. So here are some practical ways to, um, to address the cost of health care without allowing the federal government to become the health care decider. The federalization of health care would be bad medicine for the American people. And one way to prevent that from happening is to propose positive alternatives. And that's what we're going to discuss today. And the first person I'm going to discuss health savings accounts with is Pat Zakula. Correct? Exactly. Pat Zakula. She called me George Brush. <laughs> yeah. All right. Where are you from? I'm from uh, Northeast Indiana. Northeast Indiana. Fabulous. Yeah. And uh, so, what do you do? I'm the executive director of the Children First Center, and the Children First Center is a um, a child and family uh, not-for-profit organization. Uh, we provide a wide array of services to families. Uh, we provide um, education, home-based educational, therapeutic, and support services for special needs infants and toddlers. 
uh, we're involved in a program um, that identifies families who are at risk for abusing and neglecting their children as soon as they give birth, a program called Healthy Families. Um, we also do family preservation services for families who are at risk of losing their children to Child Protective Services. Uh, we do an, uh, one of the few home-based early literacy programs in the nation. Um, and we also um, sponsor a WIC program. And we've just started a new fathering program because we have such a tremendous growth in fatherless homes. Great. Thanks for doing that. You're a soldier in the Army of Compassion. Uh, so you got employees, right? How many? Yes, we have 70 employees uh, because most of our services are home-based. It takes a lot of people to do what we do. Um, most of our staff are women um, okay. from in their 20s to in their 50s. So it's, it's quite and you're expected great. to provide health insurance? That's right. And we've been doing um, providing health care, um, health insurance for people for, um, you know, for many years as we keep growing. Um, but it became a real struggle because the costs were just exorbitant. They would go up, you know, double digits every year, and sometimes twice a year they would go up. Right, which is a common problem for a lot of smaller enterprises. So how'd you deal with it? Well, of of the the 70 people we employ, we we um, we insure 30, and uh, we kept going to the the agents and kept saying, you know, we just can't do this. We you've got to find us something, and they'd keep saying, you know, there's really nothing out there. Um, and we were getting to the point where we were going to have to say we just cannot provide health care coverage anymore. We just can't do it. There's, um, we were spending uh, like $180,000 a year for health care coverage for, for 30 of our employees. Um, and I had read about HSAs, and finally um, our agent came and he said, I think we can work it out now. And so he, we um, talked with him and came up with the plan to have a high deductible insurance policy uh, with a $1,700 deductible. Before that, we had a $250 deductible, um, but $1,700 deductible and go with the HSA. And that saved us, um, well, our, our premium was cut in half. We went from paying um, over $400 a month per for a single to, to $200 a month. Yeah, See, that's interesting. Now, listen to what she's saying. First of all, they're going broke. They can't afford health care. They like many small businesses and small enterprise or small nonprofits, she's faced with a choice. Do I keep the doors open and have employees without health care, basically, is what you're saying. The HSA comes along, and so the plan, as I understand it, has a deductible of 1700 In other words, you pay for the first $1,700 of expenses, and then you have insurance to cover the... Well, That's correct, well, and it's covered 100% after you reach that $1,700. And the way this HSA works is you take the high deductible plan, $1,700 in your case, and contribute $1,700 into the plan tax-free so that the person has the $1,700 to cover expenses up until the insurance policy kicks in. I think that's the way yours works. Yes, it does. And we were able to, with the money that we saved, we as the agency were able to put considerable amount in each person's HSA See. and then they contributed the rest of it to bring it up to the $1,700. But what we had were many young people who weren't using their insurance at all. Right. And so every year we were paying those premiums to an insurance company and they were seeing nothing. But now with this HSA, if they don't use it, it builds up for them. If the $1,700 is spent, it rolls over to the next year tax-free. And the owner of the HSA can pull the money out tax-free for health care. And so it's an incentive to save. Now think about this. If, if, for example, you make healthy choices in your life and the 1700 can be rolled over, the healthier you are, the less likely you're going to spend on normal health care needs, the more money you have that you call your own. And secondly, the benefit is your employees start making decisions. Suppose you know, saying you've got to go buy X, Y, Z for this amount. People all of a sudden start to shop for that which is best for them. And uh, that's true. And people who, when when they found out that their their visit to the doctor really didn't cost twenty dollars, which was our copay, then they're not as then they don't run to the doctor all the time. However, they are using you know they're they're doing preventative care and doing the things that they need to do, but but they're you know more likely to shop around and to weigh things whether I need to do this or not. A part of the issue with health savings accounts is for people to even understand they exist. 
And so uh, you're, you're talking to an owner who is uh, on the leading edge of change. These are relatively new uh, products available. And part of the reasons why that we're discussing this is we want small business owners and individuals to realize that health savings accounts are now available. And I urge everybody to look into uh, the benefits of a health savings account. And you need to listen to Bill Lommel, who's with us. You are a owner of a health savings account. Right. I'm Bill Lommel um, from exactly. Atlanta, Lomel, Georgia. just as I said. Um. <laughs> two for two. I'm, a, I'm a, a, a commercial roofing contracting business with 25 employees, and, and like Pat, um, was faced with a similar um, decision. I mean, the, the monthly premium for our family coverage uh, two years ago went from 450 to 750, and then it was going up uh, over 1,000. And the group kept getting smaller because um, uh, people were dropping out of the plan. You know, the individuals couldn't afford their portion of the coverage, and so it was kind of a, um, an effect going on making it catch 22. Yes. So um, we met with um, all the employees and decided to stop providing it. And um, I went on the internet, and for myself, I guess is really I'm here to talk today about from, as a consumer. Um, I found um, a website on the on the internet, eHealthInsurance.com. Um, they provided a number of different alternatives, and one of those I discovered was the HSA. And I decided for um, you know, at the time I was a single parent with three kids, and with a $5,000 deductible, I was able to save $800 a month in my premium. It went from, uh, uh, go, it was going over 1000 down to 250 And just the savings were 6000 a month, more than funded the $5,000 that I could put in the health savings account. And you know, relatively that? healthy. It's important for people to understand what he's saying. He buys the high, the high deductible policy to cover major medical expenses and the savings on that policy from what he was playing otherwise more than equals the uh, the zero to five thousand dollar cost up until the new insurance kicks in it's his own money the five thousand he owns it it earns interest tax-free in other words he's able to put it in in a you know interest-bearing account and if he or his three children did not spend the five thousand whatever the balance is it rolls over to the next year and uh, it's a uh, it, it enables frankly small businesses to stay in business and families to be able to better afford health care you enjoying it yes it's great and it's made providing that benefit possible again yeah. so you know we're, we're meeting with all of our employees to, to get them signed up individually on programs and that I can kind of help Facilitate. Absolutely. Most of the working uninsured in America work for small businesses. And so for small business owners out there who are worried about being able to pay for insurance for your employees, and a lot of owners are, like you were. I mean, it's, it must be, you know, it was uh, nerve-wracking. Well, one of the key things that has come out of this um, is that when I, when I go to the doctor, I'm interested in the cost. <laughs> Yeah. And I had a. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> I had a you know a small skin cancer removed this year, and just I asked. Yeah. They offered me two procedures, and I said, well, how much does this one cost, and how much does that one cost? And what are their effectiveness? And they were virtually the same. So, you know, it sounds simple, but it is a dynamic that in many cases is absent from the healthcare markets, because if a third party makes that payment, he never gets to ask the question. He just accepts the decision. And all of a sudden, when you have consumers starting to ask questions about costs, it is a governor on cost at the very minimum. And so part of one way to make sure that costs don't continue to escalate is to introduce consumer demand into healthcare decision making. And since HSAs enable a consumer to own their own account and manage their own account and make decisions for their account, we've introduced demand into the marketplace. Now, thank you two for sharing this. I signed up for an HSA. Um, I'm feeling pretty good these days, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I'll have some money left over. 
Uh, but recognizing that uh, I can prevent disease, I want to encourage people to exercise on a regular basis, make wise choices about what you put in your body, and be mindful of what you eat. And if you happen to be an HSA owner like the three of us, uh, you'll realize, more likely realize savings that you can roll over tax-free and call it call your own. And, you know, hopefully one of these days when I get to be an old guy, you know, my HSA will be bulging with money and I'll be, I will be comfortable in the, in the security of retirement because my HSA will be a part of a, you know, other options to provide good health care for me and my family. Uh, we've got Rich Parsons with us. I actually got it right, two for three now. And uh, what do you do, Rich? Well, I, I run the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce, which is a small nonprofit right here in Montgomery County, Maryland, and Thank we you. represent the employer community. Good. Thanks. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Uh, you, were, we're, you were here not only to talk about the, you know, the wonderful benefits of having a business in Montgomery County, but uh, as well to discuss... Well, what we want to talk about is really the same issue you've just heard from a consumer standpoint. It's the lack of choice. It doesn't affect just consumers, but small business owners in particular and small nonprofits like ours, we have a, a very small range of choices that we can select from when we go to do what we all want to do, which is provide our employees with good coverage at good prices. We're finding our choices in a state like Maryland, um, and even though this is one of the leading biotech and medical innovation centers of the world today, we have about four policies, four companies that will even write policies for small businesses in the state. And yeah. it's, it, we've got to expand choices, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. Well, I appreciate that. That's a common sense in it. If you want uh, there to be a reasonable price, the more consumers have to choose uh, in the marketplace, the more likely it is you'll be able to find something at the price you want. I mean, that's, that's, kind of, that's how the marketplace works. You're telling me the marketplace is somewhat restricted here. Well, it, because of the regulatory factors and just the, the way the marketplace has, has turned out here in Maryland, um, we are not allowed by state law to do what some states are allowed to do, which is to offer association health plans. Right. Where Describe what an association health plan is, please. Sure. What that would do is allow organizations like our Chamber of Commerce uh, to go into the marketplace and allow the pooling of all these small groups. And, and if you think the, you know, the escalating prices that you're paying if you work for a major employer have been severe, look at what's happened to some of the small businesses out there. If you've got one or two people in your group, you're paying the highest premiums out there and you have the fewest range of choices of anyone out there. And just in, in our chamber, we have seven full-time employees. Last November, only two of them were participating in our health plan. And we were paying $2,400 a month to insure two people with good family coverage. We've had a couple new people that we've added to the staff, and thankfully we're growing. Um, but now we have five people in our plan. But just going from two people in the plan to five people in the plan, I'm now paying $2,300 a month to insure five people. And I was paying $2,400 a month to insure two. Uh, so if we can bring, you know, I have 600 companies that belong to our chamber. There's 100,000 employees in those companies. Any significant portion of those that we can pull together into a larger purchase, purchasing group, we're spreading the risk, and we can get insurers to come and give us a much better deal and really give small businesses, which is 80% of our membership, the, a level playing field and a chance to get the same kind of coverage and pricing that the larger companies are getting. Right. An association health plan will allow... Uh, people to pool risk that's what we're saying and uh, I happen to think that uh, we ought to allow small businesses to pool risk across state boundaries in other words I think a restaurateur in, in uh, Maryland ought to be able to be able to combine in the same insurance plan as a restaurateur in Texas uh, I, I think we ought to be focusing on the social objective of making sure our small business owners can find affordable health care so that fewer people are you know, working uninsured, rather than, you know, jealously guarding jurisdictional lines for whatever reason. And so I look forward to working with Congress to get an association health plan out, a bill out, that will allow for pooling of risk for small business owners across jurisdictional boundaries, and nonprofits, by the way, should be allowed to pool risk as well. And have you heard of it? health savings accounts in the meantime? I mean, these are really great. These are <laughs> I, I learned about them at this event. I'm going to look into them. Seriously, I'll look into them. <laughs> but but I, 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 Congress needs to understand that, on the one hand, you cannot complain about people who are, are, don't have insurance and you work for a small business, and then not allow small businesses to be able to have the opportunities in the marketplace, the same opportunities afforded companies with large pools. Uh, you know, large employee bases. You, you got to give them the opportunity to be able to shop. 
And so association health plans make a lot of sense. I want to thank you for sharing that with us, Rich. Well, thank you. We need the help in Congress. I agree. That's what we're here to do. Uh, we're here to remind Congress about the benefits. <laughs> Jesse Patton. Yes, sir. Right. Just like the general. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> The founder and president of uh, Associations Marketing Group in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. We're actually uh, an insurance agency that specializes in the sale and service of both individual and group health insurance plans. And we do business in 42 states. So we work with individuals not only in Iowa, but uh, across the, all of the United States. And Jesse wants to talk about an idea that I broached early on, uh, and that is to allow consumers to shop. Correct. The, the president has proposed instead of you having to buy your health insurance based on uh, the zip code in which you live, uh, you would be able to look across the United States at various states um, and be able to purchase health insurance based on that. Um, today, uh, what we find in the marketplace is it's um, increasingly tough for us to provide affordable coverage to a lot of folks in a number of states because of regulation that has occurred. Um, if we look back to 1965, we have roughly had seven mandates in the United States. Uh, today, those mandates uh, amount to over 2,800 state mandates that either mandate specific benefits that an insurance company must cover or uh, specific things like community rating, guaranteed issue, um, and those mandates increase costs for individuals. Um, and it also causes insurance companies uh, to make decisions whether they do business in a state or not. And so what we find, just like in the small group marketplace, is, is that less competitions uh, in those markets mean much higher rates. Um, so it's important uh, to stimulate competition. Uh, those mandates are one thing that uh, really increase the cost, along with the fact that a lot of our states have not enacted high-risk pools uh, or have um, funding problems with those high-risk pools. Now, thanks to the President and the Senate and the House, uh, the federal government has supplied some funding for high-risk pools um, in some of the legislations that we've done. Uh, so again, that helps stimulate competition in those marketplaces. Uh, the nice thing about uh, this proposal uh, is that people would be able to go across state lines, but they would still have the safety feature of having their products still regulated by insurance division, insurance commissioner. Yeah, that, that's they, an important point. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. You were on a roll. And you're go ahead, you're the president. <laughs> Thank you. I'm uh, just a general. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you're you're a you you heard Bill talk about he got on the internet. He was trying to find more information. He he was worried about you know finding a product that he could use. Imagine someone uh, living in Maryland getting on the internet and being able to shop nationwide for an insurance plan that meets his or her specific needs, basically what you're saying. Correct. If you, know, if you look at an example that we did for your staff of a 35-year-old uh, individual with a 35-year-old spouse and two children on a $500 deductible, um, premiums from the various states, uh, my home state of Iowa, that premium actually comes in at $430. Uh, other states that we looked at, those premiums are at $1,500, $1,200, $1,609. You know, up to a thousand dollars difference in that individual rate for the same product, same insurance carrier, uh, just based on the uh, state that you reside in. Right, and so perhaps one way to encourage reform, uh, and at the state level, is to allow consumers to actually uh, make choices. And the more consumers that buy a product in a certain state, may cause other states to have the incentive necessary to change the regulatory burden so that products can be delivered at a more, less expensive price in their own states. But the real question people have is, well, how do I know I'm not getting cheated? Now, there's just one thing to open up an additional consumer price. But how do you know it's not a fly-by-night or a, you know, a shyster? You know, we caught a guy the other day flim-flamming people on the tsunami relief effort. I mean, how, there's a lot of you know, innocent folks who think they're making a contribution in this case to help somebody's life, and it turns out he was a you know, the, F the FBI found out and, uh, you know, that he was a flim-flam artist. How do we make sure that the innocent consumer is not buying a, you know, a product from a company that doesn't have the capital base necessary to provide insurance, for example? Correct. And then there's actually a couple safety features here. Uh, I, as an insurance agent, uh, am licensed and, and uh, 
able to do business based on a license I hold by the uh, insurance uh, division of the state that I operate in. I must also get a non-resident license uh, in another state that I plan to sell business. So I'm actually regulated if I would sell a product here in Maryland. I'm actually regulated by the insurance division in Maryland under my insurance license here. Plus I'm also regulated by the insurance division in Iowa, which is my own base. Um, and then again, you would have the insurance commissioner's office also regulating the carrier and the product. Um, right. So in other words, if you're a Texan buying into Iowa, uh, and you feel like you've been cheated, there would be a complaint mechanism. Correct. And the state would therefore make the decisions as to whether or not the, uh, on the capital worthiness of a particular entity offering insurance in that state. Correct. You would actually have two safety features, your home state and your state that you were buying right. uh, your insurance from. I think it's an interesting idea. I think, I think the more we, we give a choice to consumers, and the more consumers are allowed to be in the marketplace uh, designing and, and shopping for product that meets their needs, the more likely it is we'll be able to control costs and uh, you know make the make the marketplace work. It works in other industry, and uh, I think we need to bring. I know we need to bring market forces into the healthcare field. Uh, for those of you who live in Maryland, by the way, you're fortunate to have a governor who understands all this. I appreciate your efforts, by the way, on medical liability reform, dressing the cost. You yeah. got that right. Uh, Tammy uh, runs an interesting program. Why don't you describe your program, Tammy? Again, I'm Tammy Fleming from New Orleans, and I'm representing Kingsley House, which is a nonprofit in New Orleans whose mission is strengthening, children, strengthening children and building families. And one of the ways we're doing that is through the program which I manage, Healthcare for All. And Healthcare for All is basically <clears throat> a community-based strategy where we employ community residents who are certified by the state to go door to door and conduct outreach, identify families with children and uninsured adults, and then we enroll them right in their homes. Yeah, the point is, is that we have programs aimed at helping uh, people who need help, basically is what you're saying. And one such program is S-CHIP. That's the Children's Health Care uh, Insurance Program. And it's not fully subscribed. In other words, we had the money available, and states did not access the money to help children with good health care. Correct. In Louisiana, as you know, Mr. President, we're ranked 50th, the least healthiest state in the nation. And one of the things we're trying to do is increase health, health access to some of our most vulnerable people. That's our children, our elderly, our poor, and our working poor. But we have to do this with a concerted effort of public, private, ventures, um, sort of what we're doing in New Orleans. We have the state working with us, and we have some in, um, investments by private foundation like the Casey Foundation and Baptist Community Ministries who really invest in this process and really wants folks to get those more high-risk families or families that's hard to reach, ones who will not necessarily go into a traditional Medicaid office or welfare office because they're working poor and the stigma associated with welfare a lot of these families just don't want to be associated with but the S-CHIP program was really geared to our working class families you may have one or two parents in a home working but still cannot afford to cover their kids yeah. health insurance. and the reason we've asked Tammy to come is because it's very important for states to develop effective outreach programs we're at the federal level we're willing to help fund uh, outreach programs. We think it's important for people who qualified for uh, the S-CHIP program to know that that program is available without stigma. I mean, it, and it, it is an effective way to provide our children with the insurance we want our children to have. And so what Tammy is saying is uh, she's pointing up the fact that we need a grassroots effort across the country to uh, enable people to know what is available for the children's health care program. Correct. We have been very successful as five walkers and talkers, that's what our outreach workers are called, community residents, and we've enrolled over 4,000 folks in the last four and a half years. That's only uh, a scratch on the surface of Louisiana's 20% uninsured population. So it's gonna take a lot of folks doing a lot of different things, and Louisiana, fortunately, has been very creative about 
um, formulating what's called Medicaid application centers where they can get nonprofits to do some of that grassroots work. Yeah, no, that's good. And the faith community. And the faith-based community, small business owners, anyone can apply to work along with the state Medicaid department and they have to follow guidelines and do things a certain way. But it is very one of the most creative ways that we can address the issue of the uninsured especially for those kids who qualify automatically based on household income. Right. Well, I appreciate what you're doing. Walkers and talkers. That's good. Good job. Well, listen, I want to thank you all for uh, joining the discussion. Uh, you know, the, the solution is, um, is uh, one that, uh, the, the solution to health care costs is one that requires a myriad of approaches as opposed to a single federal government approach. Uh, I, I believe the more we empower people to make decisions, uh, the better off we are in terms of, uh, of achieving a national objective, which is affordable health care that's available. And I want to thank you all for sharing with people innovative ideas. I'm pleased to inform you that Dr. Condi Rice has just been confirmed by the United States Senate. She will be a great Secretary of State for the United States of America. I'm, I'm honored to be working with her, and I look forward to spreading freedom and peace. Thank you all for coming. May God bless you all.